Hi, everyone, and welcome to Bitcoin Analysis Beyond the Block for June 2024, brought to you by Ainsley Crypto. My name's Chris, and today we have our expert panel with Isaac and Joe back to update us with where we are in the Bitcoin cycle with some analysis and discussion, looking at the macro fundamentals, market and on-chain technicals, and everything else in between. How are you going today, team? Doing really good, Chris. Great. Thanks, Chris. Great to be back, mate. It is. It's it's been another. Um, we say this sort of every month. There's a lot happening, but it really is in this space at the moment. We've we've gone through um, a lot of sort of big news in the market about things that are things that are happening that impact Bitcoin. But we've also had sort of interesting price movements that we'll discuss as well. So a lot to get into as there is each time. We'll use our same format where we start the big picture macro, work our way through the market technicals um, through or the market analysis through the technical analysis. Starting off with that macro um, big picture view, Joe, we we seem to be slumping around here a little bit. Um, we we've talked about this a couple of times. This mid cycle concept where we're not really up and, and taking off as we'd hoped. We're sort of just hovering around. Is that a bad thing? A good thing? Where are we at? Well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if if uh, growth is slowing, for example, but we're still in mid cycle, our expectation going forward is that. Um, Governments will see that and they'll try to what they call goose the economy to get growth and well, potentially inflation picking up once again as well. So even though that is once again, that's turned down, we expected it to tick up based on where we see global liquidity and its effect on markets in the economy, we expect that to start moving up. And when we talk about the, this concept of cycles, like we've we've got a pretty clear idea here that we're certainly not at the end of the cycle. Like we We have a strong opinion that we're at the the start to you know early mid cycle here where where everything should pick up this chart we've talked about a couple of times when we talk specifically about crypto it seems to follow a very similar pattern that we get these these four year cycles do you want to just briefly touch on that what how does this align with the previous chart so like the like the previous chart you've got your four cycles that go through an entire um um asset uh, economic expansion or asset uh, price action uh, so obviously Winter is where um, assets perform quite uh, poorly, which is the bust phase in our previous chart. Um, spring is the early cycle, which is where we're starting to pick up in asset prices, which is exactly what we've seen. And now we're moving into summer, where historically, which is mid-cycle as well, and from the previous chart, we expect assets to continue rising before we move into late cycle, um, where we generally see asset prices uh, top out and revert. Um, back to the main. And we'll talk about specific timings in a second of where we think that happens. I mean, we've been saying generally second half of next year, um, which yep. would align with both of those charts, really. I suppose next year, if, if next year is the fall in this sort of crypto one, we tend to get very big moves in fall. So we, yep. it's, it's not necessarily the end yet, but we'll, we'll look a little bit closer at that. But if that's our overarching view, we, we got some new data this month that was a little bit confusing, I think, for a lot of people because this is the the what we call the US growth or the the manufacturing index um, data. It's not just manufacturing index down the bottom; it's manufacturing and services. But a lot of people focus on the manufacturing index, and that this little drop down here caused a lot of concern in the in the commentary, at least. What was your take on what actually happened here? Well, last month we'll note that we added uh, ISM our services PMI to that, which is actually ticked up. Manufacturing is still slightly uh, in contraction below 50, which is not necessarily, in my opinion, a concern. We can see we're grinding at a, a base there. Once again, like the previous chart, uh, sorry, like the first chart, when you see that economic growth to slow, which is a reflection of um, manufacturing and services, that's those are the periods where governments want to stimulate to get the economy um, up and moving again. So unless we see... Um, um, even, even for example, even if it had a sharp, a sharp drop, that would be an indicator that the economy is doing very poorly. So you would expect a short-term blip on the radar before the con uh, uh, governments pick up in their fiscal um, um, stimulus. And uh, I think my question specifically around this is, do you think it's overblown a little bit, the concern? Because oh, absolutely. people did just look yep. at manufacturing and it was like, oh, we're heading down. And I mean, just to straight look at the chart that doesn't look like it's falling off a cliff for starters and it feels to me like people really did not pay any attention to the fact that services had a 
substantial tick up. Like if manufacturing, if the blue line had done that, it would have been everybody cheering. The blue line has a slight reduction and it's the end of the world. What is, is this just a misinterpretation? Like, you're right. There, there's a lot of focus on the manufacturing part of this, um, of, of the PMI. So like, this is specifically US when you consider the, the, ser- the service section within the US, like that's still an extremely important part of the US economy. So to see that actually ticking up is, is, is promising from, from, in my opinion. I, and I agree. And if we, we put our leading indicator here, it, we were a bit skeptical initially when it had pulled back, but it's really nailed it quite well um, over yep. sort of that three month forward looking period to say, yes, we do have this sort of slowing period. We can expect for a little bit longer yet. Um, not slowing really, just static, because that's that's neither growth nor decline. Um, and it's really that point too, isn't it? That it doesn't, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a little bit of stagnation um in these in this data, because that's what what, to your point before, encourages central banks and governments to actually, you know, fire Stimulate. up the printer. Yeah. So you're looking specifically like so this this chart specifically, if you're looking over during the COVID crisis, um, like in, in, in a scaling sense, the reaction in terms of stimulus was so extreme that it's probably uh, it's probably throwing out a perception of how quickly this should be moving during this current time yep. based on what it, it looked like back there. You know what I mean? So, And, and that's a really good point. What, what normal looks like um, when you have a recency bias of something that was very abnormal can, can throw people off. We, that's right. We have a, a strong opinion um, that's not just opinion. It's fact by by looking at data like this that global liquidity actually drives world financial asset prices. We've talked about this before, the fact that we've got some sort of statistical cause, causation analysis there that tells us this. We have been looking very closely at the weekly global liquidity data. And recently we, we had that um, sort of air pocket we talked about where global liquidity was dipping for several weeks into that US tax season. We then had a number of weeks over this last month where we had really strong global liquidity growth. Seems to be flattening a bit here. What's your interpretation of the latest sort of move that we've seen in this chart? Yeah, so since the air pocket, which we um, spoke about uh, in March, I believe, just due to effectively tax payments and money coming out of the system to sit in the TJ, which is the Treasury spending account, We've seen quite a large move up in terms of liquidity, and that's due to a number of factors. I know we we aren't only US focused, but if you're looking specifically at the US, um, the uh, bond volatility has come down. Um, the Fed have also started to cut back on their QT. There's there's a number of factors that have driven that higher. So over the last week, we've actually seen a little bit more bond volatility, which is potentially why we're seeing, which is why we are seeing that flatten out for the. Um, over the last week, week or so, um, once again, the going forward, we expect that to continue rising, not in a straight line, but rising throughout the rest of the year. And it certainly had a, a big move, really, when you look back. I mean, that's that low there is sort of in August um, last year. You know, since then, we've just had many trillions more added in total global liquidity. So it certainly looks like it's heading in the direction we were predicting and there's nothing really stopping that from continuing on its path. Uh, yeah. We will t- only touch on this briefly because we did go into it in a bit of detail in previous videos that we've done on this, but really we highlight the point that gold and crypto and Bitcoin specifically here allow you to keep up with this very long-term black line trend of global liquidity going up. CPI inflation just doesn't keep up with the overall, what we could put in quotes, inflation, where you've got asset prices moving up um, to match the total global liquidity increase. Is there anything specifically you wanted to point about, out about the latest update to this chart? Um, I think, uh, we, and we said it last week as well, since uh, 2000, Bitcoin itself has only really been an asset since 2009 and, and, and really um, a notable asset since the mid Mid teens in the 2000s, so I think there's a potential that we really see that yellow line start to outpace that global liquidity over the next 12 months, while we see uh, money flowing to, into hard assets like gold and crypto. Absolutely. Um, looking a little bit more at the liquidity, we can see we have had a real pullback here relative to where we're expecting it to go because this is this this um, 
sine wave over the top gives us a bit of an indication of where we expect the cycle to go. And back to the point we made before a little bit about the timing, we expect that possibly late next year, even into early 2026 for that high in liquidity to come. We've had that dip down there. You can see it through this chart, looking at the countries down the left and and the greens indicating pumping liquidity in, reds indicating extracting liquidity out. Would you say that's fairly normal? Yeah, 100%. There's nothing different about the way that this cycle is playing out. It's not going to go from a, you know, look at 2022, uh, the tightening phase from world central banks. It's not going to go directly into into a very dark green like we saw in 21 mm. um, straight after a tightening phase like that. It takes time for the economy to react to the tightening conditions and the tightening financial conditions before it then cons slows considerably where the central banks would then want to start injecting significant amounts of liquidity, which will eventually have their, which will, will have their impact impacted price on um, assets. So we just have to be a bit patient. It, it takes time to flow through, time. but as you've highlighted, there's nothing really unusual about that. If we look at the chart uh, really highlighting, so this is the global liquidity cycle. You can see over a longer period of time, over a decade, and the highs and lows of the Bitcoin cycle quite nicely lining up with, particularly the lows lining up with the lows in the liquidity cycle. When we zoom in on that chart, this line here, which is the average Bitcoin price for the month, seems like it's been quite flat and we haven't really seen a lot happening. It feels like in the market when you're living it day to day that it's been highly volatile. What's your interpretation of the latest sort of data on this chart? If that was if that blue line had candlesticks, you would you'd see the volatility that you're talking about. So it's obviously just a smooth average over the course of um, over over the course of the months that we've been tracking it. Uh, in April, we had that dip in liquidity and Bitcoin's held up remarkably well if you look at the average price over that period of time. So as, as we always say, we expect, uh, or as we have been saying, we expect liquidity to pick up throughout the rest of the year and, uh, and we're going to see that blue line move up significantly past 70,000. And we have to rescale that chart, I reckon. <laughs> Confident call, but I agree there. And this, this part being so low is where our confidence comes from. We've got liquidity really at very low levels and a lot of potential for that to move much higher. We're not even in the green yet. So to think that that's the top of that chart is um, bold. Unlikely. But we'll see what Isaac has to say about it because we're now moving and look a little bit at the Bitcoin market analysis specifically. So we've got that sort of big macro view saying, well, it all looks pretty good really. Like we've got remarkably well holding up Bitcoin, you know, prices staying up there, liquidity cycle still just picking up. So we've got plenty of runway left for that to move higher. What say you, Isaac? Yeah. So what I'm looking at here is the NVRV Zen score. And we've gone over this quite a few times in the last videos. But what we're seeing right now is obviously the NVRV score took a sharp decline. Um, you saw it at a point three and it hit a, level, a lower two. So what we're seeing now is price is actually relatively high, nearly at the all-time high, um, yet the MVRV score is still quite lower from where it was at the top there. So what that's really telling us is the realized price is rising, which is essentially the average cost basis of all Bitcoins in the system. So that's giving us a good vantage point to launch from coming into this latter half. Um, in terms of how high we're going to be going, obviously that's undecided. We might not reach the euphoric levels that we once did in previous cycles, due to the fact that maybe investors are slightly smarter, but we don't know. Um, it could either, it, it could happen. It could easily happen, especially we could have some sort of short squeeze. We could have Raj retail demand coming in later. Um, purely based on green candles. Um, but again, it's undecided yet. But if I were to plot it out, I have a trend line pointing out to around the five or six region going forward. As you can see, it's been on a decline going from previous cycles. Uh, as the assets obviously gotten less volatile as it's gone on since its inception. So yeah, we're putting that around five in my eyes. I'll be looking for some sort of top there. But again, we're going to be analyzing it month to month and things can change. So it might overshoot or it might undershoot. And we'll be coupling that with our macro tools. But you're at least at a two and a half-ish level or wherever we're sitting here at the moment, we've still got double yeah. potential just to get to what high you would be predicting. As still, a it looks very one. promising and... On the other metrics, it's everything's pointing towards higher in the long term. Perfect. Now, you bring together that with other things in this combination chart. Is that painting a similar picture this month? Yeah, I would say this is painting quite a similar image here. So that little dotted line there going vertically down is also the halving point. So you can see in each cycle there too, you've 
ever since then, we, you know, we can consolidate for a little bit, but onwards from there, we start to see a large increase in price. Um, we are starting, one point I would like to add is we are starting from a more heated position in terms of our school on this chart. It's a combination chart, mm. so it includes a wide array of indicators. I think it's around 10, and it tends to have a good track history. So when we hit the 100 on the index, well, 95 to 100, which is essentially the red zone, right? That's typically signal the top. Um, during that peak, when we hit 74, it reached around 80, I think, from what I last checked. So it was very, it was still heated, but definitely not signaling a top on, on the indicators. And according to past history, it has uh, obviously hit you know, 95 to 100 every single time for each uh, cycle top. So it is what I would be expecting. Um, and even just based off where we are in the cycle, it's looking very promising. So you can see the halving line there. And ever since then, we start to shoot up. So I'd say, like Joey says in the previous episodes, it's better to be in the market than out of the market, for sure. At, at this at this phase. Now, I find this interesting because when you have that analysis there, it says potentially a little bit heated. When you look yeah. at the sentiment analysis as you do in this chart, it's I find this chart quite exciting because it indicates that even though it might be a little bit heated, there's still lots of potential runway, which would align with what we were discussing before. How, yeah. how do you interpret that here? Yeah, so I'll quickly explain this chart. I, I made this one, so obviously I'll explain it to you guys. So those orange lines there, uh, it's got exactly four years ago in the last cycle. So where we are from now today into back there, it's four-year time period. So from then in that cycle, that's when we saw the explosive growth. So a few things are different this cycle, right? So first of all, back then we didn't break the all-time high at that red, uh, at the orange line, and now we have. So there's a slight difference in positioning in terms of where we are. Um, so maybe that might minimize the ex exact, you know, the, the explosive growth a little bit, or we don't know. It's it's it, that's a thing that's too hard to predict. But based on time frames and where we are, it looks great. And we also have that time period of around 400 days or so, that mass expansion phase. Um, like last cycle. So that will put us around to, you know, mid to late 2025, which does align up with those macro indicators which we have been discussing throughout, you know, throughout this catalog of episodes we've been doing. So that is looking very promising from a technical perspective. It's matching up. But again, it will require consistent analysis as we go through. And then fear and greed, we can see there we're, we're sitting at a, you know, sort of overheated level. But to preface, we can stay at this level for a very long time. We've seen it in previous cycles. Yeah. We can stay overheated and for an extended period of time. And with it's like that saying the market can stay more ira more irrational than you can stay rational. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's what we're right now. Longer so than you can stay um, liquid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. That's and it. And this really highlights your point here, right? Where you had periods where it was very high and extended. But yeah. when you actually look at that on the chart, it wasn't, that wasn't the end of that move. Yeah. So, just because yeah. you see a high number doesn't mean you automatically need to exit. It means you need to probably have a bit of caution. That's correct. And essentially what it means going later into that latter half, you know, next year, we, we start to switch our bias from more long to then thinking more, you know, we're starting to look for tops. So you start to switch your bias as you go through the timeline there. So that's essentially how I'm positioning and what I'm looking at. Also in sentiment analysis, you've been looking at the shorter term <clears throat> um, time frame indicators that you use. So this yeah. here, you've added a couple little crosses here and you've added an interesting line. So can you just give us a little bit of an overview of how you've yeah. updated this chart? So we've gone over this one in previous episodes, essentially just an AI that collates all the information from different forums. You've got Twitter threads and Reddit, and it essentially gauges sentiment. So, you know, keywords and how crypto Twitter is doing. So it's obviously more short term. So you can see that I've done the price there. Uh, you've got the sentiment score, which is the orange, and then you've got the white line, which is the price. Um, and on that sentiment score, when the index hits a low point, so well, the red line, which I've put there, which is essentially around the 0 0.2 mark to any lower than that, we start to see a significant bottom there in price. So every time that's happened, we've seen an uh, increase. It doesn't have to be a, a huge increase. There's a few bumps that just hit the low and it just comes up to like, you know, five or 10%. But nonetheless, it signals some sort of low point. Um, it's like, obviously, when the market is really fearful, even on the short term, people think it just applies to the large term scale, but um, even on short term, it, it applies. So it's indefinitely a good indicator if you're looking for the more short term plays and even just to scale in on the dips. So that's one thing I'd be looking at for sure. It's it's fascinating that you can apply sort of a technical analysis overview to something that's actually still fundamental data 
um, here that people wouldn't necessarily do that to normally. Yeah. But it, it, it clearly works from that that chart. You also bring in when you talk about sentiment sentiment analysis, the Google Trends data that uh, you could you could almost see a similar thing happening here from a bit of a technical perspective. Yeah. So with yeah, I, I would yeah I would say the same thing here. Interest is obviously on the decline right now, but I would like to say we are we are in a very high price. Well, the price is at the all time high, and we're still and the, the, yet the interest is so low. So to me, it's priming for bullish things going forward. So obviously we can't predict the future, but I'm going to be expecting that more interest comes in once we start once we you know consolidate for a little bit, which is what I'm expecting, and start to see that push up. Uh, I think a lot of interest will come back in. Essentially, like how we had it when we broke the all-time high, interest came in, and then the ETF also created an interest going there too. But one thing I would like to add is it doesn't have to be as high and as euphoric as the last cycle. Uh, you know, people were locked away for COVID, so they had more time to sort of research and do all those types of things. But you know, the power of green candles is we, we never underestimate it. Absolutely, when when it starts happening, everyone's interested. Now, following on that theme that when it starts happening, everyone's interested. You've you've brought along a chart here today, number of new addresses. I'm not sure I've really seen this analyzed the way that you were explaining it to me earlier. So what are you actually looking for here? This is an interesting chart. It's also new to me too, but I, I think I have a good grasp of how I'm looking at it. So obviously since uh, the inception of Bitcoin, we saw very steady, large increase, almost exponential going into that 2018 point. And since then, we've seen a more consolidation and then, you know, more hot uh, during those high points in the market. That's when we reach a uh, peak number of new addresses in creation, right? And then likewise, when we hit the decline, we start to see that as potential bottom, as less interest is in the market. So typically what they'll be saying is, you know, the, the bear market's in at that point, right? And people are not interested. They've lost a bunch of money um, and people are burnt. So they're just like, stuff this. I don't want to do this. So what we start to see is it's really low, and that's when the smart money starts to enter. And we've seen it throughout all the cycles. It's not; it doesn't play out like a perfect metric. Like you can see during the cycle we just had, cycle low for 2022. Um, yeah, it didn't. It was it had, it was at a lower point, but it didn't hit the exact like it didn't go right down. It doesn't have to, right? But it's just something to be looking at, and you can see the mar market cycle. You know, during those regions of uh, hype and euphoria it starts to reach really high levels of viewer just being created. So um, right now, for me, it's looking pretty bullish that we're seeing that decline now and we're still decently high in the price. So uh, going forward, I would say this is priming for bullish things. And you, you've got another one here talking about the active addresses. So if we think about the yeah. previous one as being new addresses or people you know, coming into the network and yeah. creating a new address, this one being active addresses that are actually using it. You're sort of yeah. applying a similar approach here, that sort of technical analysis yeah. overlay. Yeah, the, I would say the approach is very similar. Like in on honest or honesty, active and then new addresses is synonymous because the, the in, it's that's it's just based off interest, right? So people are coming in. So the, there's activity in the network, right? Um, and what we've seen now, the same thing can be applied when you're seeing those low points. That's when you probably start to be looking for, you know, to buy those dips if there are dips at that point. And especially where we are in the cycle for timeline wise. I would say it'd be a smart move to do. And Joe, what's your take on that? Because I know, you know, you look very deeply into who's actually moving the money in and out of the Bitcoin in, um, ecosystem currently. So does this align with how you have been viewing the market? I, I really like those couple of last, those last couple of charts that uh, Isaac's put up. Um, the one thing I will say is we may, going forward with institutional adoption, we may mm -hmm. see a structurally lower um, new and active addresses being uh, either created or being used, just simply because um, demand, demand for Bitcoin can still go up if the same amount of, ad, uh, for example, if, if demand goes up through institutional use, then always creating new new addresses each time. If you're looking at new addresses, for example, they may just be putting the Bitcoin into the same addresses that they have. Um, I'm not going to hang my hat on that for sure. Like mm. when, when retail when retail gets in, is any, anything can happen. So like, it wouldn't surprise me if it if it does average out, like over time, average out to be a little bit lower, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly, like you said, you couldn't really hang your hat on it. It's hard to be exactly sure how it's going to play out. 
because just the greater interest overall might encourage more people to get their own addresses or whatever. Yeah. But right. I think it's certainly something to be cautious of that you don't put overly put too much weight on if we do see a structural change in how people are accessing Bitcoin itself, whether that's through these other products that don't necessarily result in a whole lot of new addresses. Yeah, you like you could compare it to the gold market from 100 years ago, I suppose. Everyone, if you wanted gold, you had to physically hold it, which would be, you know, relative to having a, a, a Bitcoin address or a Bitcoin um, new one created. If you looked at each person who owned the gold, whereas now there's there's so many other ways to get exposure to gold you, through ETFs or through futures. You don't physically need to hold the gold anymore, even though we yeah. wouldn't recommend that, generally speaking. But and and you and you couldn't have if if your metric was only doing it on that, it wouldn't make any sense when you had that explosion in other ways of holding it. Absolutely, yep. for sure. Now, the last um, chart in this section that you brought along, Isaac, is this idea of long-term holder supply falling into loss. Can you first of all explain what that actually means? Because that might not make sense to anyone how it could fall into yeah. loss when you've yeah. got the price at pretty much all-time highs. So what it, what it actually is saying is they're actually in profit. So you can see the LTH supply in loss is less than 1% if you look in the right, right uh, the metric there. So when it's down, that red line is meaning a lot of them in profit. So that's actually a good thing, right? For the, right. the long-term holders, obviously. So obviously when we start to see when they're a lot, most majority in profit, so as you can see, that 99% would be in profit according to that, what that metric says, um, that typically signals that we are coming to the stage of great euphoria levels because that's when we start to exit out. Um, it, we can stay in this phase for an extended period of time, around a year, which also run up the timelines. So I've highlighted those red, uh, those red vertical lines I've added them on, and in that time period can be around six months to a year. So that does place us around 2025, mid to late, um, which does match up with what we've been discussing in the, those macro trends too. Um, there's nothing to fear yet in my eyes, but it's something to be keeping a steady eye on going forward, especially timing cycles. So it's one of those indicators that I will be looking at heavily going forward. And just to point out, like even how I phrase that question, this is where I think a lot of people get really confused because there's a lot of data like this, this on-chain data and and market data that is actually quite intimidating to someone coming into the space who who's not familiar with it because there's a lot of technical terminology and almost jargon around how all of this works. But often underneath that is quite a simple concept. So as you've just explained, yeah. it's, it's not complex what's here. But yeah. when you look at that and you go, long-term holder supply falls into loss, what does that mean? Like that can be raise a lot of fear in people who don't yeah a lot of a lot of these on-chain charts and metrics they just scare people coming into to the space because i mean it is it is quite a lot to take in when you come in first you don't even know what things are and you're just flooded with on-chain data but yeah i 100 percent understand what you're saying there yeah and then it is just one of those that's useful to know but it shows there's lots of layers to this and there's a lot to understand correct um, this monthly Bitcoin analysis is brought to you by the Ainsley Group, Australia's trusted choice to buy, sell and swap gold, silver, platinum and crypto online or in our Brisbane and Melbourne showrooms. With over 50 years of operation, we are a reliable partner in wealth management. If you're looking to buy tokenized gold or silver anywhere in the world, check out the gold and silver standard for the security of real world precious metals combined with the flexibility of blockchain. Joe, looking at it from a slightly different angle, you've brought along, you've done this for several um, months now, brought along the charts about the ETF flows. Do you want to update us on what's going on there? Because you've also brought some interesting, uh, different analysis with this that goes sort of attaches onto this today as well. So start us off with these net Bitcoin ETF flows. So we, last week we had nearly, uh, it was just under a billion dollars worth of net inflows. Uh, so as you can see, Compared to the last previous months, the last couple of months where we've had sort of neutral, slightly positive, slightly negative sort of numbers, it's really started to pick up in the last week. We've, I think we had about, uh, we're up to about 18 days of positive inflow. So that in itself is a good sign. However, we will move on to the next chart and we'll caveat those flows. Um, at, this is CME uh, uh, futures short positions, so hedge funds shorting, shorting Bitcoin. So now I just want to pause you there because this chart has been all over x like people have been talking about this chart a lot i don't yep. think people really understand it and it's almost to the point i was just making before about isaac with some of those technical on-chain things that people can't get their head around they go what like they think oh everyone's shorting this means everyone thinks the price of bitcoin's going down i know you have a very different take on this so can you maybe step us through what this chart is actually saying 
So this is hedge funds that effectively, exactly like you said, are betting that Bitcoin's going to go down, but it's not everything it seems. So if you start at this, if you look at the start of 2024, you'll see that the short interest has really started to, um, really started to pick up, right? To the point where we've now got um, just over 18,000 contracts short, which is about, which each contract is worth five Bitcoin, for example, um, which gives us just under, just over 90,000 uh, Bitcoin in in the short position in the CME futures. Now, and that sorry, necessarily... again, so short position here, you're saying that's effectively a bet that the price is going to go down. So Correct. people yeah. who have that position make money. So there's lots of people have a position at the moment. They make money if the price of Bitcoin falls from here. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's how that's exactly right. So it's it's a little bit under six billion dollars short position in the CME futures at the moment. But what I will explain is, which is the caveat from the previous chart, is that what head funds are effectively doing is they're they're now able, they've got an easy and efficient way to go long in the futures market, oh, sorry, long in the spot market while shorting futures. And what they're actually trying to do there is they don't necessarily care about the, the, uh, the, the price of Bitcoin itself. All they care about is that futures are trading at a at a premium. So that means that they're trading above what the Bitcoin price is. And what they do is when they short that, over time as the contract gets closer to expiry, so say it's a, a, a June 30 um, contract, when it gets to June 30, it'll meet the same price as the spot price. So if they're shorting the futures, they're actually making that little bit of spread as it comes towards spot price. So they're, they're doing that in quite a large, well, as we can see, there's there's, there's quite a, a large amount of um, dollar value there, close to $6 billion. So what I was saying from the previous chart is that not all inflows are necessarily a pure long bet on Bitcoin. So it's up to $6 billion, which is effectively the short position, is the other side of that trade trying mm-hmm. to make. Um, a profit on that bait on that on that spread in price, if that makes sense. And it's something it's it's such an important explanation because it's something that people who are buying Bitcoin won't understand necessarily just as a retail holder because they're not actually making money from Bitcoin moving in this situation. They're making money from being long and short at the same time. So from your explanation, they're they're holding the long the, the they're holding the Bitcoin ETF which is a long yep. position they're, they're holding Bitcoin, they make money if the price goes up, but they're also holding a bet that the price is going to go down and they're effectively making a little arbitrage, a little profit in the middle by yep. uh, holding both of those at the same time. And all they need is for over time that premium to reduce to zero, which is how which futures it will. work. Okay, yep. all of that makes sense. My concern is that a that this works very well while the price is stable and that's what we've seen recently if the price explodes higher does this create the setup where all of these people who have these shorts all of a sudden have to close them because their losses are mounting quickly and they they are concerned that they don't aren't making the corresponding amount on the longs or they need to move money around can this all go wrong because we've heard of this in the past where you've had very large short situations where it creates a short squeeze and and rockets the price higher as everyone tries to get out of this situation. Yeah, so you can definitely if, technically it's a neutral trade, so that they shouldn't if you're if you're what they call cross collateralized on on the long and the short, you can't really get liquidated. But because they are long on one market being the ETFs, but short on the futures, if they get if we get a large quick move up particularly on, on the weekend if for example the market isn't even open mm. they can't even open open or close their trades mm. or Very good or offset offset the losses with the gains on the etf we may see well you we certainly see a squeeze but certainly a lot of volatility as as those positions as those shorts get bought back and um the etfs also get closed that have to well they have to um close out their, their long so I, it's it's really it's an sort of a known unknown. We don't, we're not exactly sure, but generally speaking, when there's a lot of leverage in the system, things are certainly more fragile. And what you've just explained it, um, is important for me because it shows what can cause the volatility out of nowhere. So this is how markets don't see anything coming. Then all of a sudden, you've got these big big moves up and down. Uh, that, yep. and, and this is what causes it. It's something, a setup like this, where you've just got massive amounts of leverage, as you just explained. Um, yep. Isaac, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, because I'm going to ask you a very specific question later, because I know you've got a chart where you talk about liquidity bands, because there's areas where this could really all come 
unravel quite quickly. And I, I know you'll yeah. um, talk about them a little bit later. So I'll come back to you on that one. Joe, this next bit of information I think is, is really interesting. This is new information you brought along about the actual size of the institutional investment. Step us through this one. Yeah, so we touched on that previous chart about hedge funds who are buying ETFs and shorting the futures. So that 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 money is not what I would call sticky. They're just in it to do that basis trade, capture that that little bit of spread and a little bit of yield. These, the majority of these um, asset managers, and or you know, there's there's actually investment boards. Like you got the state of Wisconsin investment board there. You got also all sorts sorts of um, institutions who are allocating what I would call sticky capital to Bitcoin, and they're they're the ones that are in it effectively buying Bitcoin and, and are long. They're not hedging the other side. So this is really just to give us um, some perspective, like contrary to the to the previous chart, that yes, while there are those hedge funds who are doing that basis trade, there are still large entities that are buying Bitcoin to go long. So you hear a lot about on Twitter about the, the flows into the ETF and why the price isn't going up. It's because some of that literally is just hedged in derivatives, which is making it neutral. So the money that's going in is also being offset by a short. Whereas you look at institutions like this that are just net long, for example, um, that that over time will have an upward push uh, effect on price. And some fantastically large numbers here too. Like it's really picking up in some of these these big holders. It's very exciting to see that actually. Um, yep. This next chart, this is, this is a new one as well that's really caught my attention. I'm going, we're going to need to see this one again, I think, because... It's, it's highlighting something that's really important. So can you step us through what funding rates even are for starters and then why we can see a really clear um, indication of what's going on here? So this is, uh, I would say, tightly correlated to, to sentiment, like what Isaac showed us in his previous charts. Funding rates are basically what it costs to go long on on an individual uh, cryptocurrency. So if you got, we'll just go keep it simple. You've got Bitcoin up the top there. When, when we were moving into December and the prices started going up, everyone wanted to get long. They were going long in the futures market, which means that the funding rates went up and it was actually, you, you, when, when the market gets too long, the people who are going long have to pay the people going short a small fee. So as we can see, as it gets um, quite into, into a bit of a euphoric phase, uh, phase, those fees start to get quite high. Then you get those large drawdowns where um, all those long leverage um, positions are flushed out and the, uh, the the funding rates sort of set back to neutral and that's when you're back in the green. And as the price starts to pick up, everyone gets excited again. They start going their leverage long, start pay, they have to pay, pay to be long through their futures contract, uh, perpetual futures contracts until it blows up again, we move back into the green. So we're currently in a, in a green period now, which is, which is actually a great contrarian indicator. Uh, we're going through a reset in leverage. Um, before eventually we start to move up in price again and you'll see those leverage longs come back in. And just looking at this sort of objectively, looking at the colours, you can see that it's starting to, you know, move a little bit darker into some of the oranges or whatever here anyway. So it's looking about right in that term. It's also looking about right in timing because we've had a similar sort of time between the last time it took off. But what I find most fascinating about this is all these different, look, talk about moving together. Like it's almost yep. a straight line where you can see that all the cryptos were actually responding in the exact same way. So this yep. idea that everything has decoupled and is operating independently, this is, I think this really pours a lot of cold water on that straight up. Absolutely. It's, it's a, a very clear correlation. Everything just follows Bitcoin effectively. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's really powerful to look at that. And I think we might come back to that again in um, future months because it's really, um, makes it very clear to me at least that what, what you can see, you know, sort of what's going on, particularly if you see it across the board, it's it, a very well, good sentiment indicator. We're certainly not in the euphoric stage at the moment, so that's great. No, no. And being, being able to say that definitively, there's value in that, just being able to um, say these things and be confident uh, with some analysis tools. So now we move into that bit that sort of Isaac has prepared where we look specifically into the technical analysis. As we point out every time, the technical analysis is really about supporting what we're saying in that big picture macro, um, as well as the market, what's actually going on in the market to see if it all lines up. Start us off here with the cycles update that you've put together, Isaac. Yeah. So where we're sitting right now, we're sitting around halfway through the bull market, according to my, according to my green little bars here at the top there. So we're sitting there and we're sort of seeing a similar pattern on the stochastic RSI. So during the 2020 cycle there, you saw the, the stochastic start to downtrend there. People were probably thinking, oh, this is really bad. This is not good. 
Um, but since then, we had that sharp rise into that euphoric stage, right? Um, we're sort of forming a similar sort of pattern right now. The only difference is the timelines. It's happening a bit later on than the last time. But, um, you know, it doesn't have to happen exactly in terms of when it did happen in the last time. But it is looking very similar. So it, it does look like a promising setup as we go through. And we could potentially see that cross on the monthly going forward in a few months ahead. Um, and that's going to be quite bullish in my opinion. When uh, you now, this go, one here. Sorry, I was just going to say, when when you look at that and you think about the the view that it's following uh, the pattern, it looks to me like it's actually quite a normal pattern again. And this is a, hot, a topic that we've been mentioning throughout. It's There's nothing abnormal about that, is there? It's very yep. much what we've seen consistently in other cycles. It's a very normal looking pattern. It's not, nothing really erratic about it at all. 100%. And I know a lot of people on crypto Twitter, especially the ones I've been tracking, uh, like the retail ones, they've been freaking out about that stochastic going down, thinking the top, top of the cycle's in. We're mm. disregarding all the other metrics that we've been looking at, pointing towards more higher prices in the latter, the latter stages. Um, but yeah, it is one metric to be looking at, but I think there's nothing to worry about in that one. Yeah. Um, here we've got the weekly. Uh, I've also got a stochastic RSI down there too. And during the last episode, I was talking about how we saw we were going to see a flip. It didn't get flip, right? But during that point, I was saying, uh, we're probably going to see a, a decent uh, price increase to around the 72K region. And we had those levels charted out before. Um, and we have since obviously reached that level. Um, but one thing I like to say now is we're starting to see the stochastic RSI some taper off now, opposed to just doing a sharp rise up how mm -hmm. you would normally expect it to play out. Um, to me, what that's showing is potentially more consolidation ahead, which is a stance that I'm sort of placing myself on now uh, going forward. This is only short term. Just keep that in mind. So long term, obviously, keep that longer, you know, more bullish bias. But short term wise, I'm sort of expecting more consolidation, uh, especially through the 60 day cycles too going in forward. Um, yeah, so here we have the, the daily. I've got uh, just the another, it's essentially a stochastic RSI in the bottom there, but it also shows you momentum. Um, I'll still have the head and shoulders pattern, which has since played out, and 80% rule taking out the value area high. Um, where we are now, we're just consolidating around the value area high to the volume node at the bottom there too, which is that green line. This probably looks confusing to most people, but it's it's not that confusing. I'll briefly explain it in a simple way. So essentially that that that, that is the volume profile of the, this range. So it's showing you where a lot of trades have taken place. Um, and during those volume regions, price tends to find resistance if it's above that region and it goes into it, or if it's going into it, in terms of going upwards, it would find resistance there. So right now we're just toiling around this area. Nothing out, nothing stands out to me like crazy. So, you know, based off that last video, we've hit that region at 72, we're just consolidating. Um, here we and, are. With uh, the I have a question on this one because like we we follow this fairly closely looking at these 60 day cycles and and you um i know bob lucas who was who's sort of the the founder of a lot of the cycle work on that 60 day he was sort of cl claiming the potential for the high being in a little bit earlier um you've got a bit of a different take on it here how yeah. how are you coming up with it, with your sort of figure on where that yeah. might be so the reason i've got it in the middle there and then at 30 days is because I'm just averaging it out because I don't I don't know which one to pick yet because right. on different exchanges, they've taken out different highs. So one took out the other high and then the first high was on one exchange. So it's slightly different depending on the exchange you use. You could use the index chart of all the exchanges, but it's it's, it's tricky. So right now I'm keeping in more, a more middle ground stance. It's going to put in the middle and say this overall area is like the uh, cycle high. Um, right. Obviously, yeah. it's not definitive yet. We could obviously spike through, but just going into now, I think from what I'm seeing, I think we're going to have more consolidation and we're probably going to be downtrending a little bit longer. Um, this is obviously short term, so guys don't worry about the long term. We obviously have that long term bias. But in terms of where we could see a, a daily cycle low, I've got it around there, around the 65K region in my eyes. I think it'd be a preferable level to hit. It doesn't have to hit it at all, but I think that's a good region because we've got volume levels there. We've got a support and resistance level there. And it would also prime up for a legendary... Uh, head and shoulders pattern on the large term scale. So you can see the left shoulder, right shoulder, and then if you dip down there, you'd have a right shoulder. So that'll be a nice setup to play, but obviously none of this has to happen. And but, if that um, was a just from my limited understanding of head and shoulders patterns, if if that was a proper head and shoulder or inverted head and shoulders that we saw there, that would actually predict much higher prices ahead out. Yeah, of it, yeah, 
I haven't yet uh, plotted out how hard it would put us, but I would estimate it would put us somewhere around the 85 to 90K region, right. just based off that. That would be enough out. to well and truly break through the, the yeah, highs. Yeah, 100%. That that, in from a pattern perspective, sense. I don't yes. like to put much emphasis on, emphasis on patterns because it's a, lot of, it's a lot of what retail are looking at. So I tend to go and not look at that, but it is important to have a basic understanding of what's going on from that perspective. Sure. Um, over here, we've got the pie cycle indicator. You know, what we're looking for is really just a crossover, right? Um, but obviously, we're, we're nowhere near that yet. We're sort of just trailing in, going ahead, get sort of getting closer and closer. But um, what really triggers that is that euphoric stage. And another thing I would like to add is, it, like I said before, we don't have to have euphoria in the same way like it has been in other cycles. But based off past history, it has been that way. So it would kind of be silly to think otherwise, according to history. Yep. But you sort of got to play both both sides here. Um, but you know, we would like, I would preferably like to see that euphoric, um, time, time take in place. And then we'd see that, that cross, but, uh, yeah, this is where we are now. To me, it's looking pretty bullish. Now, this is the chart I have my specific question on when we were talking before about that, the shorting effectively, and we've got a lot of, um, one-sided or not one-sided because as Jay pointed out, you know, it is balanced, but we've got a lot of betting on the price going down that could come unraveled if something happened in the market. To me, this chart, which I've I've become quite obsessed with this chart ever since you've introduced me to it in, in these videos, it feels like there's a, a lovely little target here. If it breaks that target in terms of your liquidity, it could push through quite quickly, which could also cause that cascading effect where you get all of those shorts needing to be liquidated at the same time. Is there any weight to that so the way that i'm looking at it there there's a lot of weight in that actually i think well obviously that would cause a huge short squeeze in my opinion especially even from the retail side because this chart would be tracking retail goods by the right and there's all yeah. even binance is the same you've got you've got this large short wall up there at the top there they could be doing the premium strategy trying to do that but i would say a lot of them are just thinking the tops in um but yeah if we hit that and trigger through that would cause quite a large spike up um, and I also think that that would, you know, what I was saying there before, that might harm those hedge funds and it could cause some sort of cascade. I'm not entirely sure yet, but I think that's a very good point you just made there too. And I, the other part of that point is, do we get the flip side of that? So it might cause the big spike, but then also people have to sell. So it might, you know, I, I think it could actually be very volatile both directions. It could cause a yeah. big spike up. And then because that price has moved up and a lot of people were hurt in the process of that price moving up, that they end up having to dump some of their other side of yeah. the transaction, which could be just raw yeah. Bitcoin selling as well. So it could be highly volatile. Yeah, it could be, you could see a huge wick. You, I'm not, I'm not going to point out and say what's going to happen, but there's a lot of things that can happen during volatile times for sure. Okay. Um, oh, before we before we skip to the next chart, just wanted like to add, we were looking at uh, those those few arrows I've got there. So yeah. we we're looking at that low, which was taken out. That was two episodes ago, and then the second arrow we've got there, which was another uh, another liquidity region, which we saw consolidation at. And then I had my eyes set on seventy two thousand dollars, which we did hit, but I had it a little bit higher because I at that point in time there was nice liquidity. Obviously, since the chart's been updated, there's more layers that have been added to it. But you know, I wanted to hit that a little bit higher, but we came pretty close to it. But now we're just sort of consolidating between this region and we've also got a nice level of liquidity down on the lower wick there too, which is around the 65, 66K region. So that also opens up that window for consolidation, which I've been speaking about too. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, you've spoken about this one several times in the past that often it tells us there's nothing to pay attention to. It looks like you've got a little yeah. bit of actual divergence there, which is what you seem to be looking for in this chart. There, there is. Is that the case at yeah, the moment? Yeah, there is. This 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 one's I'm because uh, because I'm leaning more you know the daily cycles are pointing to more consolidation slash uh, going down and we're seeing the stochastics uh, sort of consolidating right I'm not going to put too much emphasis on this one so I just like to preface that out there saying now not too much emphasis but there is a divergence on it I'm not going to ignore that we're seeing price increase open interest increase yet CBD going down so this is a bullish divergence um <laughs> yeah I. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say about this one because I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more neutral in my perspective. So, but I would just like to present that to you guys and let you know there is a CBD divergence uh, on the Bybit chart, especially. Yeah. So, so you would your interpretation of that is effectively you're you're 
view is more neutral, but there are some indications. It's a, it's yeah. neutral plus, we'll call it, where you've got yeah. the upward bias if if there was a bias that you need to pick. Um, well, that, that brings us to the end of the analysis of that. As we tend to do here, we like to sort of wrap up with some final thoughts on, on where you think it's all heading for the month ahead or just whatever else you want to sort of bring to our attention. Joe, do you want to start us off um, this month? Yeah, so we've been saying the last couple of months that we there's a, there's a good chance that we go through a choppy period, which we started saying in, in April. We've got May and potentially the rest of June as well. Um, I suppose I'll say what I always say. When it, the dips are for buying and just have that really long-term time horizon, um, looking looking towards the end of this year and into next year, um, where we predict um, our liquidity top will be and um, just keep watching and we'll, we'll let you know when when we just when we've um we've we've picked the top ourselves <laughs> which will be to the day and to the minute i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> to, the wick, to the wick to the wick yeah um my, my we'll point i uh, would like to say joy joy you just phrased it perfectly uh just would like to add is on the technical side which is what i cover i would like to say i'm expecting that more consolidation phase so from other from all those short-term folks out there uh yeah i'm expecting consolidation to the next few days to a few weeks going into that six day cycle low and then setting up for a nice pattern, which we'd hope would play out. But um, yeah, and so really with what Joey's saying, I think that's the, the main gist of it. And, and from my perspective, combining sort of what both of you have said, I can certainly see the potential for a little bit longer in that sideways choppy range. But I think I would lean more towards the making sure I'm in the market um, and exposed as much as I want to be really now because any that, particularly when that's why I'm so interested in that chart with the liquidity band there where where it's there and the the massive amount of shorting that's going on these things can happen usually un, in an unexpected way and often on the back of uh, a piece of information or something that happens in the world or you know, it can be nothing at all even but you just get something that causes a cascade that really pushes those prices through and then we're off and often and racing and through those levels and all over the place so I don't think it's one that you want to play too cautiously on particularly when Isaac comes in you know and, and is saying neutral with a slight positive bias I'd be well okay that's good enough to to be exposure yeah you know, having exposure there because mm. you certainly weren't coming in and saying you think it's down so you know I'd yeah, yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd be cautious on that uh like I'd be cautious on that background about not not being exposed I think that's the greater risk here so I think 100%. yeah well thank you um gentlemen for joining us today again and and bringing all of that insight and, and wisdom to it. It's it's really useful. We've got lots of information in there that, that I think people will need to probably watch over a couple of times to pick out all the specifics. But even in a month that's somewhat flat and boring, there's still plenty in there. So thank you very much for that. That's all right. Enjoyed it. No worries, Chris. Thanks. I'll uh, see you next month. Thank you. We'll see you then. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll chat again soon.